<laughs> okay, one hour from now. Okay, so I'll talk fast, uh, and I'll um, not do much by way of introduction except to say that uh, I'm happy to be here. I'm a professor at Boston University. I've worked on uh, various kinds of measurement and analysis of networks for uh, a long time, and I am going to be here until July. My office is uh, right on this floor, and I would love to talk to you about what you're doing. Uh, so please don't hesitate to knock on my door and uh, introduce yourselves. So I'll, I'll start uh, right in. Um, I want to tell you about a sort of a collection of work that all falls under a, a similar theme. And because it's a collection of work, I have a lot of collaborators. And I, I, won't, I won't list them all for, uh, I won't mention them all because uh, we are short on time. But you may see people whose names you know. These are people that I've worked with for a long time. And um, almost all of the uh, important and interesting things I'm going to tell you about are due to things that they've done. Uh, so as I said in my abstract, I'll, I'll talk uh, at first a little bit about a, um, a inspiring sort of theme. So when I was a kid, I went to the library a lot. My parents took me to the library, and I read a lot of books. I was always going to the science fiction shelves. And so I used to read a lot of books by this guy, Isaac Asimov. Uh, and uh, then um, I uh, grew up, got a job, and I wound up working at Boston University. And I found out, well, he wrote all these books that I was reading while he was a professor at Boston University. He was a professor of biochemistry. And he uh, wrote um, a particular book I'll mention called Foundation when he was living in Somerville, which is actually where I lived for a while. And uh, he was a, known as a great teacher. He got all kinds of uh, teaching awards. Uh, I don't know of anything he did on the research side that was uh, notable, but um, he had an amazing career as a writer. So he wrote like 300 books or something uh, un unbelievable. And uh, of the books that he wrote, um, the ones I want to mention are these three books that I read probably when I was 10 or 12 years old. And, um, they're about a uh, time, you know, long ago and far away, whatever, the, the uh, galactic uh, scale story about uh, an empire, a galactic empire collapsing and people trying to uh, preserve civilization. Anybody, anybody see, know these books? Good, good. <laughs> Classic edition. And you can see uh, in this edition, this little uh, emblem winner of the Hugo Award for the best all-time science fiction series. So it's pretty, pretty good, right? So what the idea was in these books was that there was this master scientist who was able to predict what was going to happen for thousands of years into the future because mathematics. He was going to use mathematics to predict how people behaved. And he was going to be able to create this sort of uh, set of equations, the, people, the, the book talks about people standing around the board writing equations uh, that predict the future history of mankind. Right? So he's going to write these equations that were going to tell us what's going to happen, how the empire is going to collapse, how it's going to come back, and all this stuff. Call this psychohistory. Mathematical predictions about the behaviors of large groups. And so I used to think this is like a, what an amazingly crazy idea. You know, it's just no way is that something that makes any, uh, it, it has any potential to, to be realized in the real world. So what I want to say today is that, yeah, that's exactly what we're doing in the real world. And I want to give you examples today of how we can use mathematics to describe the behavior of large groups of people and use that to make progress on various kinds of problems that are relevant from an engineering and social standpoint. So here's my thesis today. My thesis is that when we look at an aggregate collection of a large amount of human behavior, we typically find that it exhibits this property of low dimensionality, which is what I'm going to describe in a minute. Low dimensionality in human behavior. And um, the canonical example, I, I just disconnected something. It's probably, I touch this cord. Oh. 
So the canonical example that I'm going to give is the example of the Netflix prize. How many people have heard of the Netflix prize? Good. So in the case of the Netflix prize, a um, Netflix back in the day when it was still shipping DVDs to people's houses, wanted to be able to predict what people thought of a movie before they viewed it in order to optimize what movies people get sent. It was expensive when they sent them back. And uh, those are my research notes for a different project. So let me try and <laughs> let me try to get switched to something else. There we go. Um, and um, so they set out this 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 um, challenge that they were going to uh, you know pr s create this sort of sanitized list of uh, of movie preferences that people have exhibited and ask scientists data scientists to be able to to, to predict the missing values. And so this was sort of the beginning of the whole Kaggle kind of style competition. And the idea behind the specific challenge that Netflix put out was they, they created this, what you could think of as an enormous matrix which was mostly missing. About 500,000 rows, 18,000 movies, and inside the matrix were the ratings for the movies that people had actually watched some of the gradings, and they held some back, and they tested on the held back data. They, uh, just to give you a sense of you know, how much there is in here, um, the average user rated about 200 movies. The average movie was rated by about 500 users. This means that basically about 1% of the values in this matrix were present, and the rest just missing. You just want to be able to predict what's missing. The key idea that the eventual winners used um, is that they made the assumption that the rating matrix, the true rating matrix, if you had the entire matrix filled in, would be low dimensional. So this is, uh, I'm using low rank uh, as a, another uh, phrase for the same thing. So what this means is essentially that this matrix, uh, this true matrix, could be approximated pretty well as the product of two much smaller matrices. As the product, if you imagine M and, M are, M and N are very, very large, we would approximate this matrix as the product of an M by K matrix and a K by N matrix. So these are, um, uh, and K is a parameter that is typically a, surprisingly small. So typically uh, the uh, solutions that worked well used uh, ranks of 20 or, or 40. So what does this mean? Well, you can think of this, roughly speaking, as assigning each user a k-dimensional vector which somehow encodes their preferences and assigning each movie a k-dimensional vector which somehow describes the features of the movie that are relevant. Uh, so, um, the important thing to realize is that if this matrix were to grow, typically we would not expect K to grow. The, so, the, so the information in this matrix is really a uh, order N sort of content, not N squared. And the other thing to recognize is that we don't really expect this matrix to be exactly rank 20 or rank 40, but just close enough. It just effectively, in other words, it's well approximated by a matrix of rank 20, okay? With that introduction now, I'll talk to you about three things that uh, have relied on low dimensionality in human behavior and try to sort of give you a picture of the general philosophy that can be used in a lot of, which I think can be extended to a lot of other problems as well. So the first problem that I'm going to talk about today in which this phenomenon shows up is uh, the problem that I call inferring invisible traffic. So I work a lot in uh, measurements of network traffic. We're talking now about sort of numbers of bytes flowing over links over some period of time, typically in an ISP. 
And you would, can often you know, encounter a situation where you've got two ISPs and there's traffic flowing through each of the ISPs. So think about an ISP in the middle of the network. There's got some, you know, some users are making requests for some content and those requests are flowing through this ISP and the content flowing back is flowing backwards through this ISP. Uh, each network, of course, measure, can measure and certainly would measure its own traffic in order to do capacity planning and prediction. Uh, but I want to ask the following question. Can a, a network measuring its own traffic make accurate predictions about traffic going through a different network? Well, if you look, if you draw the picture like this, it doesn't look like the answer would be yes. It doesn't look like there's any obvious way to do this. But the reality is that networks, ISPs have to cooperate. They collaborate in order to transit traffic for each other, which means that in reality, there's often traffic that flows in this way. So the question then is, is there information discernible between the black and the green that allows us to infer some of the red? So let's make this problem extremely simple. So we still have the red and the green uh, networks, but now we're only going to talk about two sources, um, two, let's say, two destinations for traffic and two sources of traffic. If you think about this as a matrix, you realize that we could put the sources here and the destinations here, and we could say from um, any particular vantage point, we could see three out of these four values. So then the question is, if I showed you this matrix, could you infer the red question mark? If I showed you real values? Of course, not unless you made some assumptions, but the assumption we're gonna make is that the matrix is low rank. Once we make this assumption, it becomes possible to infer this guy, which is in fact this flow, okay? So we're gonna be able to infer the volume of traffic flowing through a network without measuring it. Here's the, uh, the uh, measurement setup. We took two weeks of complete traffic from uh, two real ISPs, and this is kind of a schematic of how the ISPs are arranged. Uh, each ISP, P and T, both have lots of customer networks. There is a link between T and P, so T is actually a customer P, so some traffic flows between T and P, but lots of traffic flows between T's customers and other places that aren't going through P. In fact, only about 25% of T's traffic is going through P. So here is the traffic going through P in volume, traffic going through T in volume, and here's the fraction of it that's going through both. So the first thing we need to establish is that our assumption about traffic matrices is true. Are these really low rank matrices? Are, these, are we able to make a low dimensional assumption about the behavior of the, the underlying traffic? So we measured lots of different traffic matrices. We had this data, so we extracted lots of traffic matrices. And what this plot shows you is the error when you approximate the real data with a low rank matrix. And this is the rank of the matrix we're using as the approximation. So what this shows you is that the error in approximating drops very rapidly, almost to a negligible amount for even a very low rank approximation. So uh, approximation of, of five gives you good error, approximation of rank 10 gives you remarkably low error. So we're gonna go forward then. We're gonna assume then that these partially observed matrices, if we could see them all, would in fact be low rank. Why is that the case? I don't have an answer that I can prove to you as to why traffic matrices are low rank, but I think you can imagine a model in which a set of content 
providers are out there, and each one has sort of mix of different kinds of content. And that there are users out there pulling content from these, and each of them has a preference for different amounts of content in different proportions. And if these number of different content types is small enough, this becomes low rank. This is a reasonable interpretation, but I don't have any proof that this is the actual reason behind this. Nonetheless, we're going to use it, and we're going to use it in a sort of, a, we're going to use this phenomenon in a local way. So we're going to basically say that we can take a small section of the matrix that's observed, along with um, some traffic to the same destination that's observed, and some traffic coming from the same source that's observed, and we can use a linear model to predict a missing flow between a source and a destination. And how well does this work? It works surprisingly well. So here is the uh, uh, traffic that is flowing through both T and P, excuse me, and here is the prediction from T's vantage point, the prediction of all the traffic flowing through P. The predictions are pretty good whether you're looking at packets or bytes. And we can make furthermore, we can make interesting sort of, from a business standpoint, interesting observations. Imagine the P, well, it's, it is the case that T is a customer of P. So it's certainly a sales person for P would be interested in asking our customer, how much business are they doing with our competitors? Well, that translates into asking how much traffic is flowing over this link and how much traffic is flowing over this link. And in fact, uh, here's the agreement between the predictions and reality for the traffic flowing over this link and predic uh, predictions versus reality for traffic flowing over this link. Now, this uh, doesn't always work. There are errors. This is the distribution of errors. And then way outside the distribution are four uh, extremely wrong measurements, predictions. These are all underestimates where the predicted value was much smaller than the observed value. And why? Uh, three of these turned out to be um, uh, a special relationship between T and O in which these were sister networks that were exchanging very large software uh, distributions, Linux distributions, and the third one was a denial of service attack. So in some sense, we're also, you, we can use this if we want to think, to uh, compare predictions with reality and observe unusual behavior. And so this kind of brings me to the next topic that I'll talk about, which is uh, exploiting this principle as a feature of normality in human behavior. So when we think about security, um, from an anomaly detection standpoint, the, the philosophy of anomaly detection for security is to be able to identify normality and pinpoint deviations from normality. If you had a lot of labeled data, then the right way to do this from a data standpoint would be to train a classifier or build a model. Um, but we don't have uh, a lot of labeled data, typically. We want to be able to do this in an unsupervised way. Without knowing uh, what anomalies look like, we want to be able to nonetheless identify them. So let's use this claim, this, norm, this low dimensionality claim. As I say, I, I claim that aggregate human behavior is typically low dimensional. So let's assume that most of the users in our data set, or most of the traffic flows in our network are normal, okay? 
So if that's the case, then the low dimensional component of our data represents normality. And so we, we can actually use this principle to start to do anomaly detection without labels by simply assuming that uh, most data, most users are normal and that normal users are low dimensional. So this yields a method for anomaly detection called the subspace method. And here's a sort of a, a quick geometric intuition about the subspace method for anomaly detection. Uh, imagine that we have data with two features. This could be, for example, in a network, this could be the traffic on one link in the network and the traffic on another link in the network. And we make uh, the assumption, we make the observation here that this, that this is effectively low rank. What do I mean by that? I mean it's not a bad model to treat this as a linear relationship. Then, if we do that, we can identify this, the component of variation which is within the low rank subspace. So in this case, we have a one dimensional subspace and we can identify the remaining dimensions as uh, the anomalous, the space of anomalous behavior. And then we can look at individual points, like take this Y point out here, and we can do anomaly detection as follows. First of all, notice that Y is well within the range of variation, the normal range of variation, both in this feature and in this feature, right? It wouldn't be possible just looking at the value of Y on this axis or this axis to really identify it as an anomaly. But when we ask ourselves, how do we break this value into its components in the normal and residual spaces, we see that it's got an extremely high component in the anomalous subspace. That's basically what we're going to do. Turning this into um, uh, something that works in arbitrary dimensions is just an exercise in uh, linear algebra and we use the singular value decomposition to find the set of principal components that do, uh, the set of dimensions, if you will, that best describe the variation in the data. Um, so we take the um, some number of singular vectors. Typically, this is a small number because we believe that the data is low rank. And we simply project the data onto the normal subspace. In this picture, that's the operation of taking Y and projecting it here. Can I ask something? Yes. So for finding the normal subspace, you can, we can still find the normal subspace uh, uh, in a robust way. It means that uh, by analyzing also the other points, the anomaly points. That's so right. So that's, so the idea basically is that if a small fraction of the points are anomalous, then it is ignored by the then it's ignored by this singular value decomposition step and because the anomaly is pure bladed. Pardon me? It appears and the and, right. points appear as anomaly right. when you That's right. approximate it with this. Uh, That's right. Yes. Exactly. And then we simply ask ourselves between the prediction or the projection of the data in the normal subspace and its actual value, how much deviation is there? Uh, so I can show you some uh, examples of this in a couple different settings. The first one is uh, behavior in data network traffic. And then later on we'll talk about fraudulent behavior in social media. Okay. I've been talking fast because I feel that there's a, a, a time limit over my head, but if, if there's any questions, don't hesitate. Shall we go on? Yes? I think there's a question related to the first part. Yep. So uh, actually, it's not clear to me what is the training phase and what is the validation phase. I mean, when you, I guess- This is unsupervised. There's no validation. So 
But I guess you have to understand what are what what is the uh, when you do dimensionality reduction, you yep. have to understand what is the U. Right? No, no, not here. In the in the uh, prediction of traffic, uh, when you have this question mark. So. Ah uh, yes. Right. There you have to compute here? some. No, before, 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 before. Uh, yes. So there, there was a matrix multiplication. I may have skipped over it. Yeah. This is, I think, where maybe U shows up. But go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Yep. yeah. So there is a matrix multiplication. Yep. This matrix with uh, size k. Yes. You have to find, compute these values, right? That's right. And you compute these values based on matrices, matrices you already know. That's right. Right. Now and then, okay, on these matrices you already know. You train your model by right. finding these matrices, and then you get good results of match. Right. But what happens if I show you a matrix that is completely new to your model? Would we see the same accuracy that you showed in the previous slide? So the the, the model doesn't work by, this is not a, a sort of classifier that you train a classifier and then you apply it to future data. So we don't, we're not thinking in, in that mindset of generalizing from training to testing. We're talking about uh, an unsupervised method where we make the leap of faith that the data is low dimensional and that the low dimensional component's normal. So under that leap of faith, we don't need labeled data. We don't need to train or test. We can apply this to each new data set independently as it arrives. Does that make sense? But you learn a different model. Yes, it's definitely a learn. It's a, it's a new model for it's each. A new model, yes. Yeah, that's correct. Yep. Maybe if I understood what you can say is that uh, abnormal points will not influence the calculation of you. Uh, within, within the bounds of reasonable behavior, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Uh, there's a lot. There's a lot more I could say about this. So, I, but I, uh, let me keep going. But there's there's more we could talk about afterward. Uh, so the first thing we'll talk about is uh, applying this to data network traffic. So we have a. a um, network traffic from a couple of different uh, networks. One is from the Abilene Network, the uh, research uh, backbone in the US, and one is from the uh, network in uh, Sprint in Europe. And one is from Jayant, which is the, the research backbone, or was the research backbone for uh, uh, networks in Europe. And we were able to collect NetFlow data from each of these networks. Uh, binned at five minutes. So what that means is that it's a time series. Each link gives us a time series in which each value is the number of bytes that flowed over five minutes over that link. And so together, all the links give us a matrix, right? And this is a, just to give you a sense of what this data kind of looks like. This is a picture of the different flows that are flowing in different parts of the Abilene network. So here's what the flow looks like between Chicago and New York. But over here is what the flow looks like exit, entering and exiting in Denver. Uh, here's, uh, right. So you see that there's lots of different kinds of patterns in this data. This is not the kind of data where you would want to sit down and try to build, let's say, a time series model for each one of these. It would be a very tedious and um, probably difficult process. But when we treat them as a single matrix, put them all together into a single matrix, we observe once again, extremely low dimensionality. So uh, these are uh, two different sets of measurements from the Sprint network and also the Abilene network. And we see that with about five principal, with about five dimensions or five principal components, we can approximate these matrices to within about a 1% relative error. So that's what we're going to do. <coughs> And we're going to use our, our subspace method to decompose uh, each flow. Well, actually, the aggregate of all flows, we're going to decompose them. And then this is a picture of what each flow looks like broken into its components. 
just to give you a sense of what the subspace method is doing, here's one of those time series. Uh, here is the top seven components and you see uh, that there is remarkable regularity, five weekdays that are all about the same, two weekend days that are a little bit different. But what has been taken out when we look at the top components are these unusual excursions from normality. And where do these, ex these unusual excursions show up? They show up in the rest, the projection onto the remaining dimensions. So here we can see in the remaining components that this uh, bump and this drop have been separated out, pulled out and put aside. So this is a way of uh, sort of thinking about anomaly detection when anomalies are exhibited as unusual volume. So just to give you uh, a quick summary of the kind of results that this work was able to show, when we manually label volume anomalies inside the data, which means we go in and we look at the, down at the level of individual net flow records where there are unusually high values. We uh, wind up labeling these points. When we then project all the data into its um, residual subspace, we wind up with a picture like this and you can see that it's not hard to set a threshold that gives you very good um, precision and, and recall on this uh, set of labeled points. Okay, so, um, uh, so that's the basic idea of how to exploit low dimensionality to identify unusual situations, unusual behavior in network traffic. Can I ask something? Yeah. So what these are showing is a, uh, a, a point in time in which the collection of all the links, the traffic flowing over an entire set of links as a group is unusual. Okay, so that means that it, there's a lot of ways it could be unusual. It could be unusual because one of the links is very high, many of the links are very high, some of them are, you know, low or whatever. We, there are ways to, once you've identified the point, there's ways to extract different cases, but. So these points are aggregated, this collection of. Uh, that's right, so what we're looking at right now is actually the, the, the norm of these vectors. So you think of each, you can think, one way to think of the data is it's a time series of vectors. And so now we're looking at the norm of each vector. So we're saying, you know, how big is the total amount of traffic in the network as a, uh, you know, as a vector? And that's what these are too. That's, that's also this. So it's, it's not telling you exactly what is going on at the individual link layer, but once you've, do, once you've identified the point, it's easy to actually go in and see what's going wrong at the individual link layer. Yeah, okay. So let's talk about pushing us closer to um, human behavior. The last uh, study I wanna talk about today is one in which this principle, uh, we, we applied this principle for understanding behavior on social media. So uh, this was done about four years ago, so you know, bear with me if some of the things sound a little dated because it's a very fast moving area and things change very fast. But at the time, uh, and I'm sure still true today, there were, there were black market services that would allow people to manipulate ratings on social media, manipulate the popularity of user, generate artificial ad clicks. Um, and in particular, we'll talk about like spammers. So on Facebook, uh, it's a, a valuable thing to have someone hit like on your page, especially if you're a business. And so there is a very active world of people spamming, creating fake likes, spamming likes. And these are examples of services 
that sell you real looking Facebook users, 100% guaranteed likes, 1,000 likes for $4. Uh, and this was a huge problem at the time. I think it still is not at all a solved problem, but there was a lot of media around the fact that uh, ads were being clicked on fraudulently. And here was a, uh, a minister in the, um, um, actually the prime minister in Cambodia who uh, was accused of buying fake likes for his, for his web page. Um, since late January, the number of accounts that have liked the prime minister's Facebook page has soared. Uh, an opponent seized on the statistics to discredit the prime minister's popularity. He accused Mr. Hunsen of buying likes from click farms. So uh, that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about click farms and identifying fraudulent likes on Facebook. We have a bunch of data that we're going to start from. The first data that we'll talk about is to give you the sense that this phenomenon of low dimensionality occurs. So we've got about 14,000 Facebook users and we're able to measure how many likes per day they each uh, emit. And there's a lot of measurement technology behind this and I'm not gonna go into it, but I'll be happy to tell you all the grody details offline. Um, so we can measure the number of likes each day. We can measure the number of likes as they're spread across categories because Facebook puts pages into categories. And we can even measure the entropy of the like distribution each day. So this is a combination of time and space. We did something similar for Yelp reviewers. Number of reviews each day. Number of reviews across 445 categories. Uh, something similar for Twitter users um, where we had grouped um, uh, individuals into topic groups. And what we find is that no matter where we look, the data is extremely low dimensional. So in the case of Facebook, it's not a bad approximation to approximate mo th this Facebook data as being about five dimensional. Uh, in the case of Yelp, again, I mean, some of this is uh, ex you know, extremely low dimensional, like basically uh, seven components is almost perfect accuracy. Twitter, same thing. We get extremely low effective dimension for all of this data. So everywhere we look, every time we do this for, to a matrix, we get a picture that looks like this. So um, what we did then was we studied three kinds of fake likes. We studied uh, black market likes, so this, that, like that ad I showed you at the beginning. You go to someone and you say, I'm going to pay you $1,000 and you're you, I have got, I, I've got, I'm going to pay you $27 and you've got a thousand real looking Facebook users and they're going to like my page. Collusion networks are interesting. People uh, collude. Collusion is a big topic in the U.S. right now, but that's a politics joke. So collusion is a, is a big deal on Facebook in which people get together in groups and they like each other's pages for credits. Now, um, I thought that this was only an academic <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, they probably use very uh, sophisticated uh, bidding algorithms. But anyway, they, you can also pay cash, and that's what we did. We didn't, we didn't like other users. We just paid the cash to get them to like us. And here again, it was about $25 at the time for 1,000 likes. And then the last kind of fake likes are users get infected in, with malware in their browser, typically, that generates likes on their behalf while they're logged into Facebook, and they don't know it. So you're just looking at your Facebook page, but meanwhile, under the covers, the software is sending out likes to all kinds of crazy pages under control of a central server. The central server is selling those likes, okay? via some very uh, remarkable measurement methods that I didn't invent, but uh, the folks I worked with were brilliant in, in developing these. We were able to collect uh, 6,800 users who were verified to be either in one of these three categories. So they were truly fraudulent users and their likes were considered to be 100% fraudulent. And this led to um, 
two million likes that we were able to obtain on Facebook. Using that method that we described and the fact that as I showed you these social media time series are low dimensional, uh, we could uh, applying the subspace detector get a detection rate of about 66 percent at an extremely low false positive rate. Uh, and we have different, as, as I mentioned, different ways of measuring user behavior. But since they all essentially show this low dimensional property, as I showed you, they all give you reasonable behavior as a uh, basis for anomaly detection. Um, again, we're not training on this data, right? This is, this, this is just taking the collection of all measured data and putting it through the, um, the subspace detection method. What we find is that 99% of the black market users are flagged, 64% of the compromised users are flagged, 92% of the colluding users are, fra are flagged. Um, so in terms of recall at least, we're doing great. This is a very, um, you know, um, we're able to, you know, what we've, if, if someone is, is uh, behaving fraudulently, it seems like this method is uh, pretty good at detecting this. Can you say what, what qualitatively are the characteristics which allow you to recognize the black market? Is it because they emit their lights very concentrated time? Or? I mean, uh, well, I don't know qualitatively how to distinguish no, I mean, black market from the others, but, but in general, yeah. right, in general, users have uh, correlated preferences. So if I like, I don't know, a Boston football team, I'm going to like a Boston baseball team, a Boston basketball team, okay? Mm -hmm. But randomly liking uh, sports teams yeah. isn't going to show that at all, right? Mm -hmm. Another thing that happens from a temporal standpoint is that when, as we saw with the Prime Minister of Cambodia, when you buy likes, you have a day when you have suddenly enormous spike of likes, right? So from a temporal standpoint, this doesn't have this, the spread out property that normal behavior has. Yeah. Can you use this to build a better fake like generator? Uh, so that's a great question. You know, given this is, uh, doesn't require labeled data, could, a, uh, could a, an adversary run this and then start generating likes are not detected. Yeah, I think so. It will increase the cost. It will increase the cost. Uh, like privacy. And, you know, to, in some ways, it's, um, um, in some ways, it defeats the purpose, right? Because all of these folks are liking specific things for a reason, right? They're liking because they're getting paid to like the Prime Minister of Cambodia. If you force yourself to fit within the model, then you can't send all your likes to the Prime Minister of Cambodia. You've got to send some to the President of Australia or whatever, right? So it's not, um, it's not trivially uh, defeatable in a way that's economically very valuable. Um, okay. And um, collaboration. So um, before this paper was published, uh, the team met with uh, Facebook, let them know about the method and let them know about the users that were detected. And, uh, and Facebook assured us that uh, they have their methods and that they are uh, they take care of this problem, and um, they're working on it. Uh, and, you know, I think that that's true. Uh, but if you look at the state of the system six months later, 
uh, we went back and looked at the users that we had uh, identified manually, we had those 6,000 known malicious users. And almost all of them were still there. 92% of them were still, uh, their accounts were still valid, active. If you look at the likes that we identified as being fraudulent, about half of them had been removed. Okay, actually technically some of them, if, if you purchase likes and you can, not if you purchase likes, um, this gets into ad purchases. I won't, let me not go into that, but we, part of the study also involved some ad purchases. But anyway, the 50% the of the likes had been removed. So basically what we're seeing is that even though there is an active process for cleaning the data on Facebook, there's room for improvement. And even 10 months later, we saw that 48% uh, of the likes were still there. So I suspect that there's a cleaning process that cleans them in the first few months and then after that. Um, okay. So it appears that I talked successfully quickly. So I have a minute if anybody's got questions. Um, here's the bottom line. Across a, a bunch of projects that I've done, it's, I've found that a very effective assumption to make about human behavior is that it's low dimensional. Yes. We can take mathematics, we can apply it to collections of large groups of people, we can predict what they're gonna do. Just like Isaac Asimov imagined back in 1947. And that I thought was so crazy when I was reading it in the 70s. In fact, it's a good default assumption. In the sense that I, I find when uh, I look at a, a, a new source of data in matrix form that it's when I, uh, looking at the spectrum, that's the curve of error. It's, uh, it's the first thing I'm gonna do because it's almost always gonna give you leverage in understanding the data and potentially in doing something interesting with the data. Uh, one uh, implication of this is that if the data is originally in high dimension, in other words, your, your low uh, assumption is maybe five, but the data actually presents itself in a hundred or a thousand dimensions. And anomalies are going to stand out very clearly, and threshold setting is not a, it's not a hard problem. Unsupervised classification isn't difficult between uh, anomalous and uh, non anomalous by just treating the dominant subspace as normal. So I'm glad I read this book when I was in um, sixth grade or seventh grade. Um, I now endorse it as the best all-time science fiction series, just like the uh, writers uh, did in the 60s, um, but more for the reasons that have inspired me in my research. <laughs> it's not fiction anymore, exactly. Okay, questions? Dimensionality naturally when you when you measure things like sizes of flows which you've done and things like that and you measure them in one place and you say well this is typical of the internet you measure popularity of content in some log and you say well this is typical of popularity I'm, I'm just saying it's, it's kind of natural I think though that um, um, I think we're doing more than that here, right? Uh, but I do think that, um, the ex you know, the extent to which um, measurements in one place are reflective of measurements in other places, I would say that's enhanced by this view because, I mean, I would say the example would be the unseen traffic prediction. You're basically saying that I know where A, I know where A is going to which one or two. I know B's going to one, so I'm going to predict that B's going to two because I know that A goes to one, right? So that's the kind of 
uh, it's kind of an extension. It's a it's a it's a finer grained extension of that principle of. Sure, I mean that's just true. Right. Yep. But also the, the the traffic matrix prediction. That's a classical problem. You usually just measure aggregates of flows, and then you want to deduce what the point to point flows are. Is that is that? Also, can you put that in your framework as well? Um. So one of the. Uh, one of the studies we did that uses this principle for that problem was to ask if you're going to measure a subset of the flows and use that subset to predict the aggregate. How do you select the subset? All right. So this is a selection problem and what it, that boils down to then is selecting a, a set of columns of the matrix that can be used to reconstruct the rest, right? Which do, also relies on this low dimension property. Um, so uh, uh, at one point you referred to uh, other anomaly detection methods mm -hmm. and you said well, it would be hard, it would be laborious to train them up on each of these right. uh, time series. Um, I'm just wondering, compared to other uh -huh. anomaly detection methods, um, how would you do a side-by-side -side comparison of, of what you're doing here and, uh, and, and, and what they do? Um, I, th I think side-by-side -side comparison can be done. I don't have uh, examples in these slides that are to your point, but the side by side comparison can be done when you, whenever you've got labeled data, you've got known uh, anomalies. So, um, I'm, uh, in the case of um, the, f uh, the social media work, uh, I'm trying to remember um, uh, comparisons that we did because there we had labeled data. I'll have to go back and look at it. But basically, I think that the challenge in comparing these, and this is really an enormous sort of field in, in, in data sciences, having uh, really a, enough ground truth to be able to compare apples to apples methods one to the other. So if you're asking me if this, if, if I've demonstrated today that this method is the most accurate, I haven't, haven't been able to demonstrate that today. But um, I do think that the, you know, what I, what I really want to fall back on is that the principle that is being used here uh, shows up so often that it's, it's a very valuable one to take into account when you're thinking about attacking this problem in general. Um, and at least in some cases, it gave very good results for Yep. So, uh, uh, why should this low dimensional T be always in terms of linear relations? And, uh, so, why not uh, I don't know, manifold or whatever relations? Like in physics. Right. So, uh, the I mean, I think the short answer to your question is that uh, when you broaden your scope to look at nonlinear relationships, you're essentially encompassing all of machine learning. You're basically saying, at this point, um, I just want to know whether something can be learned, whether a phenomenon can be represented, the phenomenon that presents in high dimension can be represented in a compact form that may not just be coefficients, but may also be you know, uh, functions. And um, in some sense, this is one small corner uh, of a relatively simple kind of machine learning. Um, and it's, in another sense, a sort of a, um, a guiding principle that I think it just turns out to be true that oftentimes it is a linear relationship. Oftentimes you can, you can think of latent vectors as all you need to know 
to, to represent uh, a set of problems. But clearly, I mean, computer vision is a world in which, uh, uh, you know, nonlinear manifold, you know, manifolds are extracted from high dimensional data and that's um, e extremely successful. And for vision or, or even image analysis, you know, this is not going to be as effective. Okay, thank you.